Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Keep Right On, the Birmingham City podcast brought to you from us here at Birmingham Live. Uh, we welcome you. Hottish on the heels that news blues of the news that Blues have appointed Chris Davis as their new manager. After an extensive search, they, they say that Sullivan speak to more than 40 candidates or their representatives. I think it's fair to say that not many of us anticipated Davis coming through that field, but come through it he did. And in a fitting piece of symmetry, Blues have turned to Tottenham Hotspur, scene of their last Premier League game for the man to take them back there. I'm joined today uh, by Alex Dickin, as I normally am. Can't seem to shake him. How are you doing, Alex? I'm good, thank you, Brian. Thanks for joining us on your day off. Um, and I'm also joined by Football London's Tottenham Hotspur correspondent, Alistair Gold. Ali, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. You know, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to chat about a, a very talented gentleman you're getting to come to the club. Well, that, that's all we need from you, Ali. Thank you very much. <laughs> really, really good news to hear. Um, so, yeah, obviously, uh, as, as Ali's just said, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Davis has spent the last season as a member of Ange Postacoglu's backroom team um, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. So we'll get straight into it because not not many of us know too much about Chris. Uh, I think what we do know is that he's tended to be a disciple or a follower of Brendan Rodgers through most of his career, coaching career, um, yet he turned up at Tottenham as part of uh, Postacoglu's staff. Um, how did that come about, Ali, and how does Ange actually know him? Um, to be fair, whenever Ange goes to a new club, he pretty much sets up a brand new kind of uh, set of staff every single time he goes there. It's part of his, uh, just like a challenge a buzz that he loves every time he goes somewhere to almost create a new set of disciples i guess it is to spread the word of postacoglu um, and he and he looks for like minds and the thing with chris davies is chris davies well you've seen it in the brendan rogers football he loves possession based attacking football and that fits in with the postacoglu way very much and i think spurs had some very talented young candidates within the club already in ryan mason and matt wells who have come up through the academy setup as well and had been former players for the club and i think they just wanted a bit of experience from outside the club um and chris davies fit the bill nicely um kind of a strange symmetry really in Brendan Rodgers going to Celtic and taking some of Ange's former staff and Ange has gone back and taken one of his long-time collaborators to come to Tottenham. Um, and yeah, just just a, a like minds. I think it was always going to be a bit of a, a season where they expected it to be a more of a short-term thing because they knew that Chris Davis was in demand, uh, turned down Swansea earlier in the season as well. But yeah, very much two like minds in the way they want the game to be played. What were his main responsibilities? I think his official job, job title was assistant manager, wasn't it? But what, what did that entail? Yeah, so he's the uh, assistant head coach. The well, he was the way the Postacoglu kind of training sessions are set up are, are quite interesting. That while there's a hierarchy kind of away from them in terms of Davies would have set up a lot of the training sessions and designed them. When they're actually in the sessions, uh, Postacoglu likes his coaches to take 15 minutes each of each session, and then they'll go and do kind of loosely fitting in with whatever Davies or Postacoglu's wanted, but ultimately there's a bit of free reign to do their own thing. So it's, yeah, 15 minutes of one coach, then 15 minutes of the next. And the idea is it's fresh and innovative and it keeps the players on their toes and challenged with different things they're going to be doing from one 15-minute spell to the next. And for Davies, yeah, it was overseeing all of that. It was involved with a lot of the planning as well. And I think one of the key things for Chris Davies was communication that's where he and Postacoglu really kind of had a symmetry in that they very much are very clear communicators, very good at imparting information quite quickly to players. And in, obviously nowadays the game's so tactical, it's been quite a dense load they have to take on. And when you've got someone like Davies, um, he's, he's got that similar thing to Postacoglu that he can get across to the players very quickly what he wants them to do. And also a very big kind of believer in youth as well. That was another thing I think that Spurs liked as well as Postacoglu liked. Yeah, interesting. Um, he was a cent central midfielder himself as uh, as a player, although his his playing career was cut short, as we'll come on to later, uh, at a very early age. Uh, he he said previously that he's he's a bit of a a, a self confessed lover of central midfielders, a bit of a central midfielder nerd in the way that the, the complexity of the role was that apparent at Spurs at all. Did 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 he sort of gravitate, or was he given responsibility for for the players who got in that position? 
I think had more overall, um, although certainly there were members of co uh, the coaching staff that were probably more focused on the attack and defence. So maybe that did leave an area in the centre for him to, yeah, I guess, uh, work on what he loves. Um, Spurs midfield was a, a strange beast last season, though. Um, the first half of the season, players like Basuma and Madison had terrific kind of first halves. And the second half just almost dropped off a cliff in their form. Um, so I wouldn't want to judge him on the midfield. <laughs> I'd probably say more more of a wider kind of remit at Tottenham. But uh, yeah, they, they played a lot of the football that Chris Davies likes to play. If, if you want to see kind of short, sharp passing football, getting the ball very quickly up the pitch, playing it out from the back, that's what you'll get with someone like him. Yeah, indeed. What's he like as a character? Obviously, you know, be, being a number one is very different from, you know, maybe not having all the responsibilities and, and being the dominant voice um, in around the training ground and in the dressing room. How did you find him as a character, Ali? Yeah, I mean, we didn't have too many dealings. Spurs like to keep us uh, away from their members of staff as much as possible. But whenever we did kind of see him before matches and pre-season and things like that, very kind of pleasant chap very nice very um yeah polite whenever he'd speak to you and, and make a point of saying hello in terms of people that talk about him within the club was a really good impression he made on people uh everyone loved him and that was from and bearing in mind he'd only been there a season that was people that was in the first team set up academy people used to rave about him he was the real link between them and the first team a lot of the time uh, a lot of the young players that we've seen at Spurs this season come through into the first team. He was kind of involved in that pathway for them uh, with Simon Davies, the academy uh, head. But yeah, ev everyone spoke very highly of him. Training sessions were always praised highly. And as a person, yeah, a good person. That was pretty much what everyone would say. Did the, did the um, sort of senior players ever, ever mention him in any of the interviews you did with them or anything like that? Interestingly, no, no. But every time, I mean, it's this is only a tiny thing, but if you kind of, I was looking through, obviously, in recent days, having, having to write a couple of stories about him and things like that, and looking through the photos, trying to find photos of him, because he is a guy that in the, you know, in the, in the past has wanted to remain one of the background people, uh, whereas now, obviously, this is his big chance to come to the foreground. So there's not many photos of him available at this time at Tottenham. You have to kind of search for him in the background. And I noticed a bit of a theme in all of the games, kind of post-match after games on the pitch, he's always hugging some big player, whether it's Son, whether it's Romero, one of the captains. So there clearly was this bond and the link between him and the, the bigger players in the in the squad. And I guess that's kind of why it worked quite well. And uh, yeah, so obviously he's been used to... Um, I wouldn't say there's too many egos at Spurs, but certainly big players with very contrasting personalities, and that should serve him in good stead for Birmingham. Yeah, indeed. There's um, obviously one of the major step ups has been a number one is is the media role. Now it doesn't sound like he's he did he was front and centre of many cameras during his time at, at Tottenham. Very much Anne's Anne's show, what Angie's show, wasn't it? Um, but he has has done media in the past. From what you hear about him, you think he'll be comfortable in in that situation. I would imagine so. Yeah, from everything I hear about him, he's a very confident guy. So yeah. I, I wouldn't imagine that would be a problem. And quite frankly, everyone raves about his communication with players. I would imagine he'll bring those communication skills to the media as well. Um, obviously, it's it's a club that needs a, a bit of a lift that he's coming into. And that's no different to the scenario. Obviously, a different kind of scale, different situation. But Tottenham were in a right mess when he and Ange and the rest of the coaching staff came along and he had to do a lot of lifting of those uh, within the club um, and I'm sure he'll be able to do that both internally and externally at Birmingham. Yeah, excellent. Is there anything else, any little tidbits or anything else you feel Blues fans might be interested in? Uh, any insight you can give us? Um, just mainly in the way he works, really, in, in that clear communication style. I think also in helping develop other young coaches as well. I think that was one of his kind of passions as well. That's something that Postacoglu is very big on. And whether that's something that Chris Davies has always done or whether it's just something he's kind of started to develop under Postacoglu. But he was, even though he was only 39, he was kind of the old elder statesman of the coaching staff under Postacoglu. Because right. you had uh, Matt Wells and Ryan Mason. I think Matt Wells is 35. Ryan Mason's only 32. Mile Jedinak come in as a coach. It was a very young coaching staff. Um, I think he saw that as part of his kind of remit as well was to help them develop. He was, he was very good with his fellow coaches. So I think in terms of creating a unit at Birmingham, that's going to be quite a big thing for him. And that's 
a, a thing to be excited about, I think. Alex, it sounds like the next logical step, man, doesn't it, really, for him to sort of branch out on his own? Yeah, I've, we've obviously been hearing rumours about him for the last probably 12 months. The Swansea link, and I think December time was quite strong, wasn't it? Um, and it, it seems quite a coup that Blues have been able to convince him to drop down to League One for his first job when there's been championship interest in him. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to what Ali's just said in terms of what he's like as a coach, um, which, you know, we, he's, got, he's got vast coaching experience, hasn't he? He's been, been a coach for 15, 20 years. Um, you know, spent the last decade working under two very high profile managers. Um, and not just that, but also the bit about the young players. You know, Blues have got a decent crop of youngsters coming through, the likes of George Hall, Ramel Donovan, Alfie Chang is coming back to fitness. Um, these guys need to be guided and their professional careers need to be forged. And hopefully Chris Davis is the man to uh, to take them and, and create them into the players that we know they can be. Yeah, indeed. I've done a bit of a career recap. Alex, do you want to run through it or shall I run through it? You go for it, mate. You've done the hard graft. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> In, indeed. Uh, so, yeah, um, he started out, as I mentioned earlier, as, as a youth team player under Brendan Rodgers at Reading. Um, before his career ended with a, obviously a, a fairly debilitating foot injury at, at age of 19. Um, left with with the next step of his life to decide, he he decided to go to university um, where he, he turned up at Loughborough College and worked like a Trojan for a couple of years there before transferring to L Loughborough University with no real academic background, it should, should be noted. Uh, and by his own admission, he said he couldn't even string a sentence together in terms of an assignment before he got to Loughborough. Uh, but he did end up finishing with a first, um, which which is I think he's rightly proud of. Um, he then went had a bit of an itinerant coaching start uh, life, went to the US, went to New Zealand uh, before returning um, and making contact with Brendan Rogers uh, and pitching up as the opposition an analyst at Swansea, uh, which is which is interesting. Um, there was there was a I read an interview with him there saying that, that uh, he would sometimes commit up to sort of seventy hours per opponent, um, which when you've got a League One program to uh, to run, uh, hopefully he's going to be getting some uh, some help with that at, at Birmingham. Um, on to Liverpool for three years there again with Brendan Rodgers, um, opposition analysis again. And he spent when Rodgers left Liverpool, he spent a short time working with Brian McDermott at Reading before Rodgers popped back up at Celtic. He was there for three years, and in their first season, um, Davis was a, a very crucial part of the backroom team that that won what they call the invincible treble. They went through an entire season winning every every trophy without losing a game. In 2019, it was off to Leicester. Um, and, in, and during their time at the King Power, Leicester finished fifth in two seasons in a row. They also won the FA Cup. But that, interestingly, they also sort of had a stylistic makeover. They went from evolved from Ranieri's counter-attacking um, side that won the title into a more possession-based team. Um, and as Ali, Ali suggested earlier, that at Celtic and Leicester, he would be the one sort of leading the training sessions and managing the other coaches and no doubt putting the content together as well. So that's that's kind of his career role in a... his career path in a nutshell. Um, under Rogers at Swansea, so we sort of tap into his philosophy a little bit. Um, under Rogers at, at Swansea, he... Uh, it was very much they, they were very much a, a possession based team uh, and I'll take a quote from one of his interviews uh, he basically says the idea was to dominate the ball with a combination of purposeful possession and high intensity pressing and then this is the really key bit Alex isn't it I don't know if you, if you can see this it talks about the fan base doesn't it mm. Uh, we, we were fortunate that we had a patient fan base and understanding people in charge of the club. They all knew that if we were to make 15 passes before making an attempt to penetrate, that was fine. There, there weren't any groans uh, when we made a sideway pass and the success that we had made, made sure that everyone saw the benefits of playing that way. Interesting. So you and I have knocked back, knocked back a, a lot about the prospect of the tilting getting a bit restive when uh, you know when the two centre halves and, and and the goalkeeper are playing keep ball. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts about that? 
I think we I mean, might have touched on this before, but I think this is why Tony Mowbray was so good previously and why I think he got close than any other manager because he was able to communicate to supporters on what he was doing. Um, and you would hope that Chris Davies will be the same. Um, one of my biggest bugbears at St Andrews last season was when Blues were trying to build from the back and I'd hear someone next to me just saying, shoot or whack it forward or whatever. And it's clearly just a, a stylistic thing the club has had over a period of time now where, you know, Blues haven't really... You know, certainly in the last decade, probably a bit longer, haven't ever been known for playing possession-based attacking mm. football, and definitely in the last decade. So it's about changing the culture, not only on the pitch with the players that he has available to him, because we saw a lot of the time last season those players weren't capable or weren't coached well enough to play that style of football, um, but not just them, the, the fans in the stands as well. And um, making sure that, like you said, Brian, when you know, Dion Sanderson and whoever plays next to him next season are you know, passing it around at the back and trying to build forward, that fans aren't absolutely screaming and on the edge of their seats, nervous that Blues are going to concede a goal because in so many games last season, that was the case. And not just because, you know, you know, not, not just from the fans really, because I felt like it when John Ruddy was playing out from the back sometimes, but that's a, that, that is a big thing. Um, and it, it, it's going to, Ali mentioned about, you know, Chris Davis communication skills is going to take, a manager who can communicate well to to the fans as well about what he is trying to do with this team to to make sure it kind of everyone is singing from the same hymn tree. And when those things happen, when those you know goals are inevitably given away from Blues trying to play out from the back, that fans don't completely turn and also stay behind the team. Ali, that sort of nervousness surely doesn't happen at, at Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> Tottenham Hotspur have been terrifying in playing back uh, out from the back this season. That's why I'm fascinated to see how what Chris Davies, what elements he takes from the Postacoglu way, and what he takes from the kind of Brendan Rodgers way. And, and I'd imagine it's going to be probably, hopefully for you guys, somewhere in the middle. Because, like I say, watching Spurs playing out from the back, the likes of Romero, Van der Ven, Porro, Doggy, it is terrifying to watch as a Spurs fan. Honestly. The, the Spurs fans are saying exactly like Alex was saying there. You can hear them like, like boot it out, just give it a whack kind of thing. And that's just the opposite of the Postacoglu way. They want to bait the press, bring the opposition forward and then play into the gaps behind them. That's exactly how they do it. The players, the midfielder will come back, they'll take the ball, they'll spin, they'll get it out wide. And yeah, I'm fascinated to see what Davies takes from that because there's a lot of merit to it and it does really open up the field of play and gives you so many opportunities to burst forward. Um, I would imagine it probably won't be to the extreme that Postacoglu likes it played, but uh, I would imagine you'll see quite an exciting brand of football at Birmingham. That'll be a big thing as well. Baiting the press is a phrase that's just sent a shiver down my spine. It really, <laughs> it really has. Um, I, I shall sit on my hands and keep my mouth shut. Um, interestingly, you, you, you've referred there, Ali, to, to it, but there being something of a compromise. And Rogers Liverpool weren't like that, were they? Um, you know, uh, Davis himself has said that the key strength of the Liverpool team was how adaptable and flexible they were. Um, he said that they didn't just look to dominate teams through possession. Uh, that they and that any side who gave them a chance to, to, to invite them on, they would do that and they would play into those gaps. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think there is a flexibility and a recognition there that it can't it can't all be one way. Um, and you know, ho hopefully Blues are hopefully I say. I think I'm hoping that Blues will introduce that into their into their play at some point. Uh, it would certainly be interesting, but you know, trying to do it on the hoof as they did last season, Alex, in the middle, you know, change style so dramatically mm -hmm. in the middle of a season that 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 was really where it went wrong, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, partly because Wayne Rooney inherited a group of players that had been used to playing a certain way, and John Eustace, and, and couldn't, you know transfer it over to a more possession-based style. Tony Mowbray did it better, obviously aided by three midfield signings in January, but this feels like the perfect opportunity. Chris Davies coming in has got the chance with so many players, 10 have already gone. Um, you know, So that's 10 new players Blues need. He's got the chance to sign players that will fit the system and fit the way that he wants to play. Um, and it can be that reset that we've been talking about. Um, they can go into pre-season, have a full pre-season under, under a new manager, play, learn the patterns of play that he wants. And hopefully, when it comes to the first game of the League One season, Blues are, you know, able to do it properly. You know, hopefully yeah. in those final few pre-season games, we'll see the fruits of their labour and we'll actually see coherent passing, which is, you know, 
we probably saw it in about four or five games last season. It wasn't, you know, the the no fear football that uh, that Knight had wanted. Oh, we said it. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, if there is if there's anything that binds the Zola and Rooney experiences, it's trying to change styles on the hoof in the season. Um, so, yeah, a- absolutely. Um, just onto the media situation. Obviously, uh, uh, Ali spoke about it, the fact he didn't do much at um, at Tottenham, if if indeed any. Uh, we, you know, we're all sort of hanging on Angie's every word, and I know I was from a distance on match of the day. I don't know if, if Ali was quite as uh, uh, enjoyed it quite as much as that. Did you, Ali? The the the, the poster Cogley were they rants? They weren't rants. Is probably the wrong word. Yeah, no, he's not a ranter. He's proselytizing, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, he likes to have a bit of fun in his press conferences, probably the best way to put it. You know, you're yeah. going to be on the receiving end of some little Postacoglu joke, or it's all, it's most of the time, it's in kind of uh, good faith. It, it's, uh, but he's good. He's, like I say, communication yeah. is one of his strong points. And we never had a dull press conference, let's put it that way. No, it's just worth noting that he he has spoken about this um, to the coach's voice, and he, he said that he got chance to do media at Celtic, uh, and made reference to the fact that the 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 the, uh, the media situation in Glasgow is as intense a goldfish bowl as you are ever going to find anywhere. I think, and uh, he also met, referred to a game that Celtic went away to Inverness and drew one all. And uh, the journalists were, asked, were talking about panic and crises and things like this. And I, and I think Celtic were top of the table by, by a million points or something. So, um, yeah, he does talk about the media and, and saying that he did did get to do some at Celtic uh, and that Rogers put him forward and that every word was scrutinised. Um, just coming back to the, the coaching side of things, because he, he, he has cut his teeth as an analyst, but also very much as a... As someone who is on the grass, to use the, the modern parlance, uh, and actually working day to day with with individual players, um, he, he he says himself, "I'm particularly interested in central midfielders because it's a position I played, and it's the most complex position." Alex, Blues have got lots of different types of central midfielders at the mm-hmm. moment. And they mean that that might not be the case once the um, transfer window kicks on, but that that that's key to making the system work, isn't it? Certainly that's where Tony Mowbray thought that that, yeah. that Blues were needed their most attention in the middle of the park to get everything ticking over nicely. Yeah, you need midfielders to be able to do everything, don't you? Take the ball yeah. from the defenders and take it forward. Sometimes they've got to carry it. Sometimes they've got to pass it. Um, I think Blues have got some really good options in central midfield at the moment. Um, if they could somehow keep some Kopech for a season in League One, then that would be, you know, incredible. Um, Alfie Chang, I think, is a very good holding midfield player. Alex Pritchard, a decent, more attacking midfield player who has been at this level before and done well. Jordan James, probably going to move on, but there are still there are really good options in that midfield. Uh, George Hall's another who could play in there if need needs be. Um, lots of different types, as you say, Brian. And the good thing about them is they're all quite technically sound players. So hopefully, yeah. you know, they really can take on board what Chris Davis is saying and um, and impress. One of the things I wanted to go back to about um, the, about the media thing at Celtic you mentioned, Brian, is that Celtic's probably the most relatable, I think, club that he's worked for in terms of Blues because Blues are going to be in League One next year and they're going to be expected to win every single week, aren't they? They're going to be the big fish in that smaller pond, whereas Celtic at the time, without a, a strong range just to play against, were that team, weren't they? So... Um, he'll definitely have to draw on those experiences of going, kind of going to every single game expecting to win. And, um, and yeah, hopefully it's, I, I find this a really interesting appointment to be honest. Hopefully it's uh, hopefully it works out. I'm sure, I'm sure he'll have lots of good ideas and it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, indeed. Once again, I would say Knighthead have certainly put their money where their mouth is or, or they've made their selection where their mouth is, haven't they? They've been, they've been consistent about what they want in terms of the style and the profile of, of their head coach. So, yeah, very interesting times indeed. Um, we'll wrap it up there. Alex, thank you very much for, for contributing um, in your own time. Ali, thank you very much for coming on and give, giving us some, some insight into, into Chris Davis. Appreciate your time as well. Um, and all that remains for me is to uh, wish everybody and Chris Davis a, a big keep right on. Thank you.